Hello and welcome to the Heat Transfer Course Conduction. This course is organized by RWTH Aachen University together with the University of Twente. My name is Wilko Rolfs and in this video we will provide you with an introduction to the topic of heat conduction. What are the learning goals in this video? So first we will look into the mechanisms of heat conduction. We will look at steady state and transient heat conduction and we will look into the problem of heat conduction with sources and sinks. The basic fundamental knowledge we learn in this video is Fourier's law. This law allows the calculation of the heat flow inside an object and also to describe and derive the temperature distribution inside an object due to a heat flow. The right image shows Joseph Fourier who lived from 1768 till 1830. The fundamentals first. So heat that we know is a thermal energy and the heat is a kinetic energy of a random undirected molecular motion. As soon as this motion becomes not random and undirected anymore, we will have a fluid flow. But if it's undirected and random distributed, then we talk about temperature. The higher the thermal energy, the higher is the molecular motion. The heat flow is energy that is transferred between two systems of different temperature. And the temperature difference is a driving potential for this energy flow. The temperature itself is a technical measure for the potential of thermal energy in a body. Heat conduction is a result of this temperature difference and driving potential and it depends on the type of material how heat conduction takes place. So for gases and liquids heat conduction is basically caused by a collision of molecules that then exchange their inner energy or their velocity or kinetic energy. In solids, heat is also transferred by lattice vibrations. So in a crystallic lattice, for instance, of a metal, this is then transferred first by those motions of the lattice and on the other side in metals there is another mechanism and that's the conduction by the movement of electrons. Here this image or video shows a nice uh, way of how energy is transferred in such a lattice. On the left side those molecules are brought into a motion and then there is a waves that travel through the material and transport the thermal energy. Let us now classify different types of heat conduction. So first, and that's the large first part of this entire lecture, is a steady state heat conduction. In the steady state heat conduction, the problem is time independent, meaning that the temperatures of the entire problem will not change. So temperature are constant inside the body and also outside the body, meaning that the entire energy that is entering the body due to Q dot in will be equal to the entire energy that leaves the body equal to Q dot out. Otherwise, if they would not be equal, there is an accumulation of energy inside this body which will then change the temperature in time and this violates the time independent problem. We can treat a lot of problems time independent such as for instance those radiators if they are operated on a longer time scale. The second part is unsteady heat conduction. In this part here that the problem becomes time dependent as shown here on this graph. A very good example is a cup of coffee that cools down over time. So there is a difference in the ingoing and outgoing heat flux and as such the temperature of the body changes. Then at the last part we have heat conduction with sources or things 
And also in this case here, Q in is not equal to Q out because inside the body we have heat being generated or dissipated. A good example here is a battery that has, due to ohmic resistances, heat losses inside and as such it becomes warm over time. Now let's go back to Fourier's law and see how we can describe the heat flux in a metal rod. The question is, what amount of heat flows through the metal rod from the hot flame to the cold side where we have the water cooling? And how does the temperature change in the metal rod between these two sides? And we can look at a good analogy here for the heat transfer and that is the electrical current which is similarly driven by a potential difference and a resistance. The heat flow, the uh, driving potential is the temperature, while for the current flow of electrical current, the driving potential is the different difference in voltage. And we have also here an ohmic resistance on the, for the current and the heat flow, we have a heat resistance. So, how does the temperature look like in this body? We of course know that the heat flows from the hot side to the cold side. We will have a look into that a few slides later on as well. So what parameters influence this problem? So first of course the temperature difference between the left part here and the right part which drives the heat flow. Then of course the material properties that determine how well heat is conducted and this is already the name of it, the thermal conductivity and the sign that we use here in this lecture is a lambda and the unit of the thermal conductivity is watt per meter kelvin. And then the cross-sectional area is the size, the amount of heat that can be transferred. Here it is of course in square meter and then we have as a last influencing parameter the distance between the hot side and the cold side. How do these in parameters influence the heat flow? So from the gut feeling we already know that if we increase the temperature difference and we thus increase the driving potential the heat flow will increase. If we increase the thermal conductivity of the material then of course the heat flow will also increase if all other parameters are maintained constant. The cross-sectional area will also lead to an increase in the heat transfer, but on the other side the distance between heat source and heat sink, if we increase this by increasing the size of the metal rod, then the temperature flow will decline. Now if we want to bring this into an equation and that is an Fourier's law. We have Q dot X which is the heat flow in the X direction in the coordinate system and the unit is Watt and we have the temperature gradient that's important so not the temperature itself or the distance itself. The important parameter is a temperature gradient. Now we have the equation here on the right upper side and we see that there is one important parameter and that's the minus here. Why is here a minus? We see that heat flows from here from the left side to the right side, so in a positive coordinate direction. However, the temperature difference here is here is a high temperature on the left side, the low temperature on the right side. If we now determine dt dx, we come to a negative slope, so the temperature goes down and because we have a negative slope, but the heat flow is in the direction of current system, we need to have this minus to be in agreement. We can see it in a very simple way, like a ball laying on the hill and rolling downwards. So the driving potential is now the height, but the ball always rolls downwards. And that's the same, we have a minus because the gradient is negative and the ball rolls in the direction um, of the current system. So this is our equation, the Fourier's law equation. Uh, here we have the parameter once more and we see here now the temperature profile in the metal rod and 
the temperature profile is linear because we do not have a heat source or we do not have uh, we assume that there are no heat losses to the other side so the heat flux is constant and as such we need to have a constant temperature difference inside the body a good example for heat conduction is the temperature of a pan sitting on a stove in this case here usually the heat flow is determined by the power of the stove and as such the temperature difference between the lower and the upper part of the pan here let's assume this here is the uh, floor of the pan will be determined by the material so the thermal conductivity as well as the thickness of the material here delta x so if we know the heat flow that is imposed by the stove and we also know the cross-sectional area that is important and the material property here the thermal conductivity then we can calculate the temperature gradient between the upper and the lower side as mentioned before the material property determine the temperature gradient inside the material we see here on the right side for a constant heat flux imposed by stove the temperature gradient for different types of materials for instance copper aluminium and steel now let's have a look at typical values for those materials copper is known to be to have a very high thermal conductivity here it is shown to have a 350 watt per meter kelvin however there are different values depending on impurities in the material that can reduce the thermal conductivity of copper aluminum has also good thermal conductivity here named to be 236 watt per meter kelvin um, moderate thermal conductivity has stainless steel even compared to copper and aluminum it's a very low thermal conductivity because stainless steel comprises of a lot of different um, uh, atoms and their interaction reduces the thermal conductivity of the material now let's go from the steady state heat transfer process to a transient heat transfer process and to the question when should I pour milk into my coffee if I want to drink the coffee at a lower temperature should I add milk before drinking or should I add milk immediately after brewing so we have to look at the transient process and at first we have a temperature of the coffee let's assume the hot coffee at 70 degrees Celsius of temp uh, at a um, directly after brewing and the environment has a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius so what happens is that the coffee cools down as shown in this exponential decaying curve we will have a look into this process and the derivation of this equation um, in later videos and on the other side we can see what happens if we add milk then to the coffee after this process has stopped we see here this is the the curve because of the scale here it's not easily to be seen that this is an exponential curve but we see here that after putting milk in we can reduce the temperature of the coffee now what happens if we introduce the milk much earlier then here we have a sudden drop of temperature initially and then the temperature declines but why is the point here the blue point higher than the red point so the reason for that is the driving temperature potential for the process of the transient cooling so for the red curve the temperature difference is high here between time 0 and time 900 seconds and in that time the coffee cools down more quickly than the temperature difference that is lower and then the heat loss to the environment is reduced and as such pouring milk into the coffee initially allows the coffee to stay longer 
on a higher temperature. How do we feel temperatures? I think you're all aware of after a long, longer winter walk where the hands have become colder that if you put your hands under the usual tap water and you pour the water around your hands, it can feel quite hot. You can do a simple experiment by putting up three bowls of water on the table, one with hot water, one with very cold water and one with water of room temperature. If you put your hands first in the hot water bassin, you will think that the room temperature bassin feels quite cold. If you do it on the other way around, putting your hands first in the ice water and then in the um, water of room temperature, you will feel that the room temperature might be quite hot. So humans actually are not able to really feel temperatures. But what humans can feel are heat flows. So if heat flows into our body, we feel that this is warm. If heat flows out of our body, it feels to be like colder. And we can explain this also nicely if we put our hand on a wood material or if we put our hand on a metal material. So if we put we all know that wood feels completely different to metal. And that's not because the surface is quite different in its feeling. It is because of the feeling of the temperature. We actually feel that if we put our hand on a wood table, that it is quite warm because the wood does not um, conduct the heat away that fast. If we put our hand on a metal table, instead, it feels much colder because the metal table is able to conduct heat away from our hand in a different manner, in a much faster manner. And as such, we can decide the materials depending on their actually way of how they can transfer heat. And we can feel or uh, distinguish between a wood and a metal slab without even seeing that material. Finally, at the end of the video, I would like to ask you a few comprehensive questions. So what is the driving potential for heat conduction? That what we have learned today is that the driving potential, of course, is the temperature, but not the temperature itself. It's a temperature dif dis uh, dis uh, difference over a um, spatial um, uh, difference. Which are the influencing variables that determine a heat flow transferred by heat conduction according to Fourier's law. This, of course, as uh, in the first question, it is the temperature gradient. And second, it is the material property. It is here the thermal conductivity. And finally, um, the heat that is transferred scales with the area. So this is the third parameter that determines the heat flow. Why must the temperature gradient in a positive current system have a negative sign in Fourier's law? This is the case because heat flows always from a location of higher potential to a location of lower potential. Just think about the example of the ball rolling down a hill. The ball rolls always downwards. So the gradient is downwards and the direction is in, uh, that, um, the, in the downwards direction. And as such, the negative sign accounts for this. Which material property is decisive for heat conduction? Of course, that's the thermal conductivity. And we have also seen the thermal conductivity for different materials such as aluminum, copper and stainless steel. Thank you for your attention.